Tonight, Unreported World has obtained access to one of the most notorious prisons in the world, in Haiti, where thousands are locked up without trial and face conditions described by the United Nations as subhuman. While Haiti is known for its recent natural disasters, reporter Shea Rhodes is in the capital of Port-au-Prince investigating a justice system in turmoil. I'm inside Haiti's biggest penitentiary, with unprecedented access to one of the most overcrowded prisons in the world. <laughs> Meeting the men who are lost in a system and who the outside world has long forgotten. <laughs> Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It's a country where very little works. The effects of the earthquake in 2010 are still visible. It devastated the nation, killing more than a quarter of a million people and destroying most of Haiti's infrastructure. Most people here survive on just $2 a day, and the capital of Port-au-Prince is plagued by crime. I've come to meet one of the most influential women in Haiti. Florence Ali is the protector of citizens, and it's her job to make sure that the government here looks after its citizens' human rights. I've arranged to meet her at the National Penitentiary, where nearly half of the country's prisoners are locked up. It's home to more than 4,000 inmates. Among them are some of Haiti's most violent, convicted murderers, rapists, and kidnappers. It's Florence's job to document human rights abuses all over the country. But she spends much of her time here because she suspects many of these men shouldn't even be in prison. Prisoners have named this block the Titanic. This place is notorious. And Florence is surrounded by people. They're all desperate to try and tell her their story and get some assistance to get out. Does this happen every time you come in? The first thing that hits you is the smell. Sweat, feces, urine. That and the barrage of noise. I've only been in here for about five minutes. I'm starting to freak out. It's totally crammed full of human bodies and everyone's desperate. They're trying to get water. They're trying to get food. They're trying to stay alive. They're locked up in these cells for 23 hours a day. As we arrive, it's breakfast. And the inmates are collecting their rations. We count 60 prisoners coming out. But inside, I count only 18 beds. The extra men sleep in makeshift hammocks or fight for space on the floor. At 72 years of age, Florence is known as Mami Flo. For many of these men, she's their only hope. And I keep being handed pieces of paper. We never judge you. Okay. So I got the six years ago. Like me, Florence is bombarded. Some of the prisoners tell me they've been here for ten years without ever facing a trial. We're getting this really overwhelming sense of responsibility. I've got all these little pieces of paper on my hands. Some of them just scribbled on the back of cigarette packets. For some people, this is their only lifeline. This is the only way to explain what's happened to them. Prison guards agree to let me speak with one of the inmates privately. He 
He says the police grabbed him as he was walking through a market, but he has no idea what the charge is. The 2010 earthquake sparked a mass prison break. Jean escaped along with the other prisoners, but was later rearrested. The law states anyone arrested should be brought before a judge within 48 hours. But in reality, that hardly ever happens. Florence takes me to see the prison governor. On a un espace de 1200 détenus. Uh -huh. On est obligé de garder aujourd'hui 4359 wow. détenus. That's nearly 400% over capacity. Il y a environ 529 qui sont condamnés. Uh -huh. Et on a 3830 détenus qui sont en détention préventive prolongée. Mais c'est beaucoup, pourquoi? Oui, c'est beaucoup. It's no wonder there's so much desperation among the inmates. 80% of them have never even been convicted. Aux autorités de la justice qu'il faut questionner sur eh, eh, le nombre des détenus qui sont en détention préventive prolongée. Oui. C'est pas à moi de, de juger le, le, les, les, les autorités de la justice. I want to track down a judge. So I'm heading across town to the courthouse, the Palais de Justice. There are more than 3,000 people in the main prison who haven't yet been tried. From what I've managed to find out, the real, the real logjam is happening at the Palais de Justice. 60% of government buildings were destroyed in the earthquake, including the old courthouse. Even though it's now been moved to a new building, the justice system is still struggling to recover. Florence knows most people in this building. If anyone can find the judge, it's her. Oh. Bonjour, oui. I'm starting to get a sense of why it's so hard for people to get a trial in Haiti. I've been in here for 10 minutes with Florence. She's knocked on two or three doors. She's had to walk into a courtroom and she still can't find a judge. Can we find some judges to speak to? Is this why there are 3,000 people in prison waiting for judgment? I'm told the judges have a two-month holiday every year. And even when they're working, they only do part-time hours. I think we found a judge. No, we haven't. We found his assistant. This is impossible. He's not in Haiti. But it's not just the lack of judges that's causing the backlog of cases. The guys in prison who tell me oh, I don't know where my file is, nothing's happening. They're not even in alphabetical order, France. Sorry, it's really no, it's really making me quite angry. Seeing this is one of the most frustrating things that I've experienced since I got here. I'm going through my book and I'm looking at all the names of the prisoners who keep coming up to me and begging me to help them. Solomon, Francis, Wesley, Johnny. All of their files are in there somewhere, but nobody could ever find them. It's complete chaos. The Haitian justice system relies entirely on handwritten documents. On top of that, 40% of Haitians can't even read and write. So if they can't afford a lawyer, they have little hope. The next morning, I meet Jacques Leton. 
He's one of the most successful human rights lawyers in the country. He represents some of those who are lost in the system. On est arrivé à les faire sortir de la prison après 5 ans, 7 ans, 8 ans, 9 ans, voire 10 ans. Jacques's been battling Haiti's justice system for 10 years. This year, he's won the release of more than 40 people who'd never even been convicted. Jacques's representing two inmates who are accused of being accessories to murder. But he's found evidence their alleged victim actually died of cholera. He wants to prove there's simply no case to answer. That's five years they've served for a murder that couldn't possibly have been committed. Now that Jacques and his team have actually met these two men and confirmed that they're here, confirmed that the story they received is true, they need to go up to the administration building and see if they can get hold of a document to prove that these two men are in prison. Once they've got that, they can then go back to the courts and try to get them released. So the first step is to actually prove they're in prison. Jacques and his team head off to speak with the prison governor to find out why none of the archive staff are around. The prison governor insists there's nothing he can do. So Jacques is forced to leave the prison to find a legal official who can certify that Hervey and Lexnor exist as prisoners. Luckily, the court that Jack needs to go to is just around the corner from the prison, so we can walk there. Oui. Donc, on a le juge. We bring the judge back to the penitentiary. The two prisoners have just been brought out for a second time today so that they can appear before this local magistrate to confirm their identity. And with this document, hopefully, they can prove that these men are actually here and then start the process of actually getting them out. It's taken four hours to get one piece of paper just to prove that the two men are in prison. Finally, Jacques has what he needs to take their case to court. Yeah. I'm told that on average, three inmates die here every month. I head to the infirmary to see the conditions. The beds are full. There are even people sleeping under the beds. Inmates are given two meals a day, but prison gruel is mostly made of flour and water. Those who don't have family to bring them regular meals can quickly become weak and malnourished. This place is like hell on earth. There are scores of men in there, emaciated, visibly sick, and they've all been crammed into the same room. I'm told that some of their families don't know they're here. Some of them have been there for years. This is where most of the deaths in this prison happen. I'm told that in one weekend, four people were taken out of here and rushed to emergency. Three of them died within days. Haiti's struggling with a cholera outbreak that was brought into the country after the earthquake. Local doctors and a foreign charity do provide medical care, but diseases like cholera travel fast here. All the men in the cells all around here are locked in for the majority of the day. They can't even leave to go to the toilet, so they do it in a bag. And when they get tired of having the bag of poo in their cell, they just chuck it out the window because, well, you would, wouldn't you? So the longer I stand here, the more uncomfortable I'm feeling. Cramped living conditions also help the spread of tuberculosis, which kills scores of prisoners every year. 
We're heading into this block of the infirmary, which is uh, where they keep everybody who's got tuberculosis. I'm told there are over 150 people in here. In many ways, this place is even more desperate than any of the other cells. These guys have to be locked in here because they're contagious. So I'm told there are 49 people locked in this cell. You can see just how angry they are. They can't leave and they can't be allowed to leave. They're frightened they might die before they see a judge. Even among the minority of prisoners who have been to court, there are shocking allegations of injustice. How long have you been in prison for? Paul Panel was thrown into prison in 2012. He went on trial three years later. Paul claims he's waiting for his release form to be handed over, something the court clerk should have done after his trial last year. We don't know if this is true, but the UN lists corruption as a major problem within Haiti's justice system. He remembers everything to do with his case. He knows his case number, his prison number. He knows the names of the lawyers, the judges, all the people who've tried to, to get bribes from him. And I feel like with a little bit of investigation, I might actually be able to find out what's going on here. Florence offers to help me track down Paul's paperwork. So he was found guilty? Paul says he was found not guilty, but there's no record of the verdict. Le juge s'en va à son bureau, il écrit le jugement. Right. Et c'est un huissier qui apporte l'ordre de jugement. Donc maintenant, il faudra que je sache qui était le juge qui l'a jugé. This is like a bad dream. Jusqu'à présent, ici, on attend le jugement de libération. Paul's adamant the judge acquitted him a year ago, but the release form is nowhere to be seen. Il faut des papiers il faut pour des savoir les libérer. Hein? Et une fois que les dossiers sont perdus, eh bien, le pauvre, il est perdu aussi. Tu comprends? Without the paperwork to back up his claims, or money to pay a bribe, he's condemned to a life in prison. Ever since I first met Paul, I've kind of wanted these details to not be true because the implications of all this, the corruption, the incompetence, the, just the, the downright laziness of it all, is almost too much for me to comprehend. And then going in there and seeing the book and seeing that actually he's telling me exactly, he's telling me the truth. And yet he's been left to rot in here. Paul's future lies in the courthouse, but on my way there, I run into more problems. I've just left the prison and I was on my way to the courthouse. I wanted to try and find out what's happening with the cases of some of the men I've met in there. But as you can see, the road's blocked off. There's burning tires here. There are more down there. I can see a group of people. There's a protest going on. I even heard gunshots a few minutes ago. There's been infighting in the Justice Department and the city's chief prosecutor has been transferred. And they've shut down the courthouse with their protest, which means that any of the men in there who are hoping to get their cases heard today it's just not going to happen. I want to put my findings to the Minister of Justice, Camille Edouard Jr. 
Haiti's had an interim government since February, and the presidential elections are just a couple of weeks away. Now, when you've got nearly 70% of the people in prison who haven't even seen a judge yet, why don't you force the judges here to work more often and maybe even trained more and employed more to get the job done? And when was the last time you actually punished somebody for corruption in this system? Côté que les difficiles pour faire ça avec les traçabilités. Justement, le non gain évidence. The national penitentiary is totally overcrowded. It's four times over capacity, and that's a breeding ground for tuberculosis. It seems to me that your failure to provide an efficient justice system is literally leading to people dying in prison. You're literally killing prisoners. How do you respond to that? Premièrement, son problème nous vient joindre, c'est pas nous qui vient avec lui, c'est défaillant système là pendant des années qui bail résultat ça. After the election, he hopes to tackle the number of pre-trial detainees and halve the prison population. Jacques finally made it to the main courthouse to try and free Harvey and Lexinor, the men accused of murdering a woman who was later found to have died of cholera. The case that Jacques and his team are getting ready for is known as a habeas corpus. He's essentially trying to argue that his clients have been wrongfully imprisoned. They don't need a hearing, they don't need an investigation, they simply need the judge to agree that there is no case to answer and they need to be freed immediately. And in order to do that, he needs to get a number of legal officials together in the same room and before a judge. In the next half hour, these five lawyers are going to find out if weeks' worth of work is going to pay off. It's now in the hands of this judge. The judge prepares to give his verdict. Jacks managed to win the release of two men who between them have spent 10 years in prison for a crime they never committed. It's a small victory. We head back to the prison one last time. The city's preparing for one of the biggest storms in a decade. Haiti is bracing itself. It's about to get hit by a Category 4 hurricane. This could be the worst natural disaster to hit the country since the earthquake in 2010. The prison is on lockdown. That evening, Hurricane Matthew slams into southern Haiti, killing more than 1,000 people and leaving 1.4 million in need of aid. The capital's relatively unscathed, but the south of Haiti is plunged into turmoil. The welfare of the country's prisoners will once again be low on the government's list of priorities. One month later, Jacques' clients Hervé and Lexenor are yet to be released. There's a dispute about their paperwork. Paul's only hope is to have another trial. But since we left him, he's fallen ill and is now in quarantine. Nearly 4,000 prisoners continue to be held without trial in the National Penitentiary. In unreported world, the team is in Madagascar, investigating why young girls are being held in prison without trial for minor crimes. Some are incarcerated for years without their families being told that they're there. Dachian Navanayagam meets these forgotten girls and tries to find out how they might get back their freedom. <laughs> 
Anserabi Prison, Central Madagascar, Women's Wing. Sahul Rabana Sol has been here a month, but has no trial date. She says she's 17. I'm here because I've heard 80% of under 18s held in Madagascar's prisons have never been to court. Do you have a lawyer? Do you know what a lawyer is? In Madagascar, authorities can hold adults in prison for over five years before being brought to trial. Girls like Sahul, who are under 18, can be held for almost three years. I mean, she's basically being left here to rot until someone decides to take her case to court and, you know, God knows when that will be. She lives in this tiny room with 30 other women. Do your parents know where you are? What was life like? All the women have just suddenly come back in and... To be honest, it's quite overwhelming. Many of the girls here are in the same situation as Sahu. Others have already been convicted some even for murder. And it's really claustrophobic, you know, you, can't, you, can't, you can barely breathe. You can just imagine what it's like if you're a young girl and you're turning up here for the first time. It's completely frightening. Sahul was working as a maid for a local doctor when her employer accused her of stealing. The doctor made the accusations after Sahul asked for her wages. Are you scared that you'll never leave here? Many of these girls also worked as maids and are accused of petty crimes. They too have been jailed with no court date in sight. I've heard the story so many times now. So many young girls who go and work as maids and then get accused of stealing something and then banged up in prison and, you know, no, no court case, no conviction. More than half of Madagascar's prison population have yet to be convicted of any crime. In fact, the number of under-18s held without trial has more than doubled in the last 10 years. It's early morning and I'm back in the prison. I meet up with Funi Rakutanarina, who tries to help young girls like Sahul. She says her parents have no idea that she's been here all this time. How is that possible? She sees how prison time is damaging the girls. What sort of effect has it had on Sahul being here? <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Thuni wants to try and find Sahul's parents, but they live in a remote village. She can't afford to travel there, so we offer to help. Every time I've spoken to her, she's been crying, and now she's smiling so much. Thuni gets Sahul to record a video message to show her parents. The next day, we set off with Funi to try to find them. Sahul is pinning her hopes on Funi finding her parents. But Funi warns us they may be hard to track down. Worse still, many parents here disown their children if they're put in jail. <laughs> Six hours later, and we're walking because the roads are so bad. Just when we thought we might have to turn back, the bus has suddenly turned up. It's really overcrowded, but they're going to make room for us. Oh, thank you. After a few hours, we arrive at Ferizio. Funi's been told it's the closest town to Sahul's village. She starts asking around for directions. These men are from the village that Sahul's parents live in. So Funi's just negotiating with them to try and see how we can get there and also how we can find her parents. So they've managed to find her dad, which is amazing, but this is almost the hard bit now, because we have to tell him where she is and then also find out if he can get to her. Salamo, <laughs> 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 
Simap tu mas, ambil lu no, ambil ni no eh. Hei, so marah dengan batikan tema mana tu lah fambi. Bukan lu fana rewa ni. Cefaulan san. Ia mana dah biar cara kau tu lah. Cefaulan san. Ia sangat. Tiap hari nanti nak wip wip cara bersara kuri bersara tu. Saya fakar fana kita bersara kuar. Ia nuwa. Fana san fana nulu ni. Mitu mitu fana san aku ni tu nak kau saul lah fasa mana. Hi, sir. But it's obviously really upsetting for them because they haven't they haven't known where she is for the last six months. Nak ukan nila pandai terus, puna tata fajar mai jadi test tamna, puni mana tiada nariwa ni fasa tu nana walis ni fahui dia tiap pun, tiap mila nari mama gaya tata sini. Si sabar tata uru nasan fahis futsun ways, saya zan tena nanti nanti we, tu kunu fata cincai mandiri le is. Sini aku uru awi lori pan, aku sini setia lori fir. I'm taken to meet the rest of Sahul's family. These are Sahul's sisters and cousins, and they're saying that they have spent the last few months trying to get in touch with her, but every time they called her employer, they were told that she was sleeping or that the woman was at work and that they would need to call back later. And this whole time, none of them knew where she was. <laughs> Sahul's sister is confused. She tells me that only last week the doctor had sent them a message asking her to come and work as a maid. Why would the doctor do that if Sahul had stolen from her? Then we discover Sahul's dad, David, is trying to borrow money for the bus fare to see her. So we offer them a lift. It's the first time Sahul's mum Jacqueline has left her village. And the first time she's been in a car. Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world. We travel all night so Jacqueline and David can see their daughter. Ah, <laughs> 
Sahu's extended family have heard what's happened to her and they've travelled overnight to Ansu Abin. Apparently they've just got here, so they're just about to come in now. The guards are saying that she only has 15 minutes and 10 of those minutes are already gone, so the whole family only have five minutes left with her. Outside, Sahul's family reveals some startling news. Okay, all right, let's go. Okay, let's go then. Okay. Sahul's employer lives minutes away from the prison. So that woman who just opened the door is the new Sahul. That's their new maid. It's my day. The doctor and her mother invite us in. Sahul's dad, David, wants to know why they were never told Sahul was in prison. We've been talking to this family for so long that it's now dark and we're having to use torches to carry on the conversation, but they're basically justifying why they put her in prison and, and saying that they haven't done anything wrong. The doctor refuses to drop her allegations. You would know that she can't afford a lawyer, and by not telling her family, by not telling anyone that's related to her who can help her, that she's there, you've denied her any chance of getting out of there. <laughs> They've said they'll only pay for the work that Sahul's done if her parents now ask for the money. It just seems bonkers, like, who, who says we'll only pay you for work you've done if you ask for it? I mean, obviously that's why she went to work for them. David says he refuses to beg for Sahul's wages. Are you going to pay this family for the work their daughter did? <laughs> Eventually, she hands the money over. It's 120,000 aria, about 25 pounds, a fraction of what's needed for a lawyer or a bribe. Human rights groups say bribery is the most common way out of prison for those accused of petty crimes. 
David and Jacqueline leave no closer to getting Sahul out of jail. I want to ask the government here why girls like Sahul are being put through this. So I'm meeting Rakotundra Jerry Randri Narasoa Sloe Nortiana, who oversees prison reform in Madagascar. According to international human rights law, no one should be held without trial indefinitely. Why are so many young girls being held in prisons in Madagascar? Some of them are barely more than children for crimes that they haven't even been convicted of yet. I'm in Mawulumbel now. Samanukan, ni efta wea, ni ulumbela reta reta, na saza, na ulundepea, tia, mana na sua, utsara ina angia na zani. Zenjint, nui esa aneto ni fu ministera fitsarana we, manja efe pecha, yeza ka na fangia na ni fitsarana. I've spoken to some people who's told me about how in order to secure their release, they've had to pay money to the prison guards. Is that part of Malagasy law process? Ala sa tafitcha natin na kulkul si kezani ara uja ka we sanday na fulla lai famwa na ulna anim funs. Te in mo fa ati tomi sa we ati tom ni kulkul sa yah te fam yesa ka mamecha ka fe pecha reja san ni to ni fumilisera fisa kana ba yati nam sa yensh ka kulkul meti isa yene ni fun ni fisa kana yene ni fun funs. Sahul is still in prison. Her family don't have the money to hire a lawyer or pay a bribe. She still has no idea when her case will come to trial. Jacqueline and David now visit her every week. <laughs> 